This is all stories that people made up a long time ago, which I get it and I read them and I like them. But English sometimes to me feels like we're making, it's the art of making up stuff on top of stuff that people made up. It's like Chaucer yeah. just made this up. I just thought, oh, you know, the music business is too tough and I'm too crazy to try it and I'm just gonna end up broke and whatever. And But then it just kind of happened. Once you make the thing that makes them all go, oh, wow, this is really, really great. This, I love this one. Will you play that again? Then every single thing you do after that means less unless it's as good or better than that thing. Yeah. Hi, this is Lauren Engel. I'm here with Max Frost. Hello. <laughs> So were you born in Texas or? I was, yeah, I'm from Austin, Texas. Yeah. Which is the, the home of South by Southwest, <laughs> the greatest queso in the world, <laughs> and uh, I would argue some of the best barbecue. Ooh. Were your parents born there or? My mom's from Corpus Christi, Texas, which is a hippie surf town on the coast, and my dad is from Laredo, Texas, which is a border town oh. that is now considered dangerous maybe, but yeah. probably not. <laughs> But your mom's kind of hippie, right? Very hippie, yeah. Yeah. Very, uh, very leftist surfer chick, mm -hmm. 60s child. Are you kind of like that, or? Uh, I'm not as hippie as her, no. I mean, I feel like, you know, Austin's not a very conservative place. It's more like my mom's just a big creative musical influence on me. She's not a musician herself, but the music that she played for me when I was young was a big influence for sure. Oh. What are your... old records like Beatles and Sam Cooke and uh, you know stuff like that that just sort of I feel like is forever an influence. Yeah. What do your parents do? Uh, my dad has sort of uh, been in the tech business for a long time. My mom is sort of she used to own a production company for a film and now oh, wow. she just is sort of a freelance marketer. So you get more of your creative side from her kind of? I think so. I mean you know I think my dad's uh a creative guy in his own way. And you started playing guitar pretty young, right? Did you learn at this place called like Dave Seabury like Rock <laughs> You've done some homework. Uh, yeah, I I started playing guitar when I was super young under a guy named Sid Sanchez under a school called the Austin School of Music that was owned by Dave Seabury. And uh, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of me playing instruments and that's kind of that was sort of like the community that they had there was sort of the place where I started learning a bunch of different instruments and being in all these different little bands and it was a very cool little like Austin you know very kind of free place where a lot of young kids were into like Stevie Ray Vaughan and stuff and everybody was doing their thing from the age of 10 to the age of 16 17 like 18 was getting to where it was like okay it's time for you to go be in a real band you can't be in rock camp bands anymore but, but then when you were like 12 you already started like performing kind of professionally right yeah i mean you know obviously i wasn't like living in my own house or something but i was playing in bands uh you know playing gigs a lot and i feel like that's a that's a big thing like gigging is pretty different from playing in your room when you're a kid you know how did you get yourself like out there initially as a solo artist uh, I just started putting music out online, like on SoundCloud, and uh, I started just, honestly, just emailing and Facebook messaging. It's so embarrassing now, I'll like, I'll get a message from someone I like, went to college or went to high school with in like 2018, you know, and, and the last message that we exchanged was in like 2012 or 2011 with mm -hmm. me. Hey man, this is the song I just made. Check it out. Like, share it with your friends. Hope you like it. See you later. See you later. And they don't even respond because at the time they were like, oh, who is this kid? Yeah. And then, like, you know, almost freaking six years later, they're like, hey man, heard your song on the radio. Heard your What's song up? Like, six years ago. Yeah. Anyways, I always thought always thought it was great, man. Just didn't respond because I was busy. Well, no, they don't say that. But yeah, something like that. Do you remember the first record you bought? First CD I bought was. Uh, Honestly, it might have been like a fr like an N Sync or a Britney Spears record. Oh really? Yeah, in like ninety eight, ninety nine, I would like go. To well, because what I wanted to buy was the Eminem record, but you couldn't buy an Eminem record when you were a kid. You had to have parental whatever. Like you had to have a parent buy it. My mom wouldn't buy it for me, so I had to just buy. I was like, oh, what else do I know? Oh, I've heard Britney. this Britney Spears stuff. <laughs> Grab that, you know. And then. 
You kind of like got approached to do like a hip hop beats, right? Or like a yeah. some sort of hook for hip hop. Yeah, I was. I used to be making more like rock music and or not rock, but more just blues, soul based stuff. And I was into hip hop, but I never really had it be part of my world until I started like meeting guys that were doing it in Austin and making beats with them and doing hooks with them and doing songs and. That was kind of the beginning of me like understanding the modern music process of working in a studio, not with a band. Was it difficult for you to get from like all the rock stuff that you're doing to more of the hip hop? Um, yes, and that you're like uncomfortable with it. You know, you're like, do I really belong? Like, can I pull this off? Is this too much of a stretch? But I've come to find that as long as you approach stuff authentic to yourself, that you need to you, if you push your boundaries you get more interesting stuff than if you stay in your comfort zone at that time were you like putting out music under your name or did you have a different alias uh no i guess i mean i was in bands that had different names but you know max frost is like the name i was called my legal name is matthew but i've been called max since i was a baby so mm. that was just sort of the name and i've i'm not great at coming up with band names so i got lucky that Mine was at least suitable for a solo artist yeah. name. I didn't have to change it to like Xavier Frost or something. <laughs> you know, Xavier Frost. Lil Uzi Frost. <laughs> whatever. Oh my gosh. How do you, how do you describe yourself back then growing up? Um I don't know. I think I was kind of a I was definitely a little bit of a smart ass kid. You know, I got in trouble in school a lot. Not like big, big trouble, sometimes big trouble. You know, I just kinda of was like always drumming on my desk or talking or cutting up or whatever, you know, I always kind of, I don't know, I guess I've always enjoyed doing the thing I'm kind of not supposed to be doing or something like that, which is what music still feels like to me. It's like when you're going into a studio and meeting someone or someone you know and you're working on music, it kind of feels like a joke in a way of like, this is like, we're, this is our job, like we're not supposed to be mm -hmm. doing this, you know, like this is like some kind of like conversation we're not supposed to be having. Um, that's kind of still what it feels like yeah. to me, but... Did you have some, like, issues with substance abuse, like, the last year of high school? Uh, I wouldn't say, like, I wouldn't say I ever was in a place where I was like, oh, man, this kid needs to go to rehab, but I feel like I definitely was in a place for a window of my life where I just wasn't very happy, you know, so mm -hmm. I was just sort of, like... I think the good thing is that I had music as an outlet, because if if substances had been the only outlet then maybe it really would have gotten out of control i think mm -hmm. it just stayed within the realm of of somewhat reasonable only because i had other ways of right of other things to focus on you know music mainly did you like school though sometimes i mean you know i was good at school like i got in trouble but i had good grades i liked the challenge of certain stuff i liked you know something to compete at with grades but inevitably I just got tired of this feeling like like I was getting fooled like oh well you need to learn this because next year they're not gonna cut you any slack and it's gonna get real serious and then it never got serious and it was just kind of like okay this is just the same thing over and over and over again it's the same thing and then that's the way I felt when I got to college and I was like okay I'm out of here yeah I can't do it anymore why did you decide to like study English like temporarily um I don't know, I didn't know what to study, you know? I was like, what am I gonna... I was okay at math, but I was like, I'm not gonna go be an engineer or something, you know? I was like... I got into the, the liberal arts honors program at, a, at UT, so I was like, I guess I'll study this, you know? But that was also, honestly probably another reason why I burned out so quick there, which, you know, no offense to anyone who studies English or whatever, but to me it just started becoming like this is all stories that people made up a long time ago, which I get it and I read them and I like them, but English sometimes to me feels like we're making, it's the art of making up stuff on top of stuff that people made up. It's like Chaucer yeah. just made this up. This is not real. This didn't happen. Chaucer just wrote this crazy long story called Canterbury Tales and we're sitting here making up all this other stuff that what it might mean on top of this thing that he made up this isn't real you know what I mean it's yeah. like at least with history there's some reason to it like that stuff really happened but with English it's like uh which is none of this is real this is all just which I'm saying there's still things to be learned from it but 
I guess I get to a place where I'm like, ah, it's just a story. Yeah. You know? At that point, did you have like your parents or someone like guiding you like career wise? Like, or were you like already set on music at that point? Like, I really before wasn't. Before you were, yeah. I really wasn't, you know, I never looked at it uh, as a realistic thing to try to do for a living. You know, not that I thought that I was bad or something, it's more just I thought, I didn't understand anything about the business, you know, and I was like, this just seems like this super lottery thing, which in some ways it sort of is, but I just thought, oh, you know, the music business is too tough and I'm too crazy to try it and I'm just going to end up broke and whatever. And But then it just kind of happened, you know. Mm-hmm. I just kind of started putting out music and it kept on... Uh, it kept on growing. Yeah. What were your parents' reaction to you, like, dropping out? Um, they weren't crazy about it. My, my older brother especially was, like, not uh, excited. Because I was going to be the first one of, of my siblings to graduate from college. Oh, wow. And so I was like, well, I can't, I'm just, you know. But then things, like, by a year from then it was becoming clearer and clearer that like, okay, things are actually kind of panning out for this, so it's not like that bad of a call, you know? Mm -hmm. And then was there a specific turning point that you were like so done with school? I, I think it was coming back for the second year. I only came back for one or two weeks and it was like, specifically there was a room. I signed up way too late for my classes, so I got some elective thing of like some cultural some culture class that was like in some weird little <laughs> tiny room that wasn't even that didn't even look like a room a college course was being taught in with like the little desks that are attached to the chair <laughs> like a high school and I walked in there and there's like 10 kids in this class and I sit down and it's the orientation and everyone's just talking and it's just like this is just I was just like that's kind of when I was like I can't do this anymore this is the same I've been doing it's crazy, I mean, you know, you, school's good for you, I guess, or whatever, I mean, that's a whole long conversation, but it's like, you think about it, and the average person, they have to deal with that for like a decade of their life, yeah. like for years and years and years, you're like, here, come in here, sit here at this thing, sit here and do this thing, and listen to this person. That's insane, you know? <laughs> and I finally just snapped. Yeah, where was your career at the point when you dropped out? Um, nowhere, I mean, I, I had some guys that were running a, uh, a screen printing company who wanted to manage me. And so that was kind of part of why I was like, okay, well, look, if there's adults that have lives of their own and careers of their own who want to take a shot, I should take a semester off and just go for it, you know? And so that, that's what was, that was kind of where I was at. There was no, like, big break or anything until, like, about a year later. How did you, like, survive financially, though? Did you move back in with your parents? I was for a while. Yeah, I was living with my mom, and I, I was working in a bar called uh, Frank that was in downtown Austin. I was bar backing there, and that was tough, you know. It's a tough gig. You're, like, leaving a bar at, like, 3 in the morning every night because Frank had these huge tables that were, like, the wood was, like, this thick, mm -hmm. and then the base was, like, this just iron base. Mm -hmm. So they weighed, like... 100 pounds, like more than 100 pounds. And every night you had to freaking stack them up at the back of the room and mop the floor. <laughs> and so your back was just like wrecked. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was a tough gig. Was it soon after that you did that South by Southwest? Yeah, it was right around that time. Yeah. yeah. And everything got stolen. Like, how did that happen? Uh, I was just uh, playing a show after South by. It was like a South by hangover show or something. It was dumb, I never even should have done it. And <laughs> my stuff was in a green room upstairs and it just got snatched, a guitar and a backpack and a hard drive with a computer that had everything I'd been doing. Yeah. Was it, and then you spent like a bit of time like, was it difficult like recalling the songs and like recreating it? Cause it was like two years worth, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, there was only a few that I really wanted to go after and that, and that was tough, yeah. I mean, that's that's something I hope I never have to go through again, knock on wood, I mean, it's just like, Cause you never can quite get back what you had, you know? Yeah. Luckily, you know, like, White Lies was already in a place where we didn't need to do anything to it. That just, we just went with what I had. Just my mix, my little bounce of it was it. So, 
That was fine. Yeah. yeah. Everything else had to be recreated, though. Like, pigeons and planes picked it up, like, three days after that, so... Yeah, pretty <laughs> much, yeah. so soon after. Yeah. And how long after that did you start meeting with, like, labels and ultimately signing? Uh, pretty quickly, it was like... You know, because that song kind of took a life of its own, and... I think it was like a month or two later, we were in New York and L.A. doing those meetings and stuff. That was pretty wild. That was a wild thing. Yeah. And you said previously, like, the greatest pop songs, you don't even remember, like, what the lyrics are about. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think so, yeah. I mean, I think, obviously, you know, I feel like I'm starting to feel like lyrics matter more and more these days, though. Because, I mean, there's great songs that are hip-hop songs that have no melody and all that there is is the lyrics, really, you know, so I don't know. But I think melody is definitely a great, great melody is like, you don't, it should make you not even care what it says. Mm -hmm. yeah. And where do you feel like you go to inspirations for so many of your videos? Like, I feel like watching them, there's like a Max Roth like style of video. Oh, I'm glad you think that. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I've always been into videos that feel a little bit unordinary. You know, I guess honestly too, I've always thought that um, a music video should be treated a little bit more like a song where you you go for an idea, but you kind of have to be a little flexible with what it turns into. You know what I mean? I, I don't think it's, sometimes you can't know exactly what's gonna be right as you go to do it. And that's why I kind of like almost like the 90s hip hop music video style of like, they just go shoot a bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. a bunch of performance and stuff, and then they just put it together and and let it just kind of be more about the performance and the energy, you know? What was the idea behind like Good Morning, the song in the video? Um, there were sort of like these key, these key ideas I had of like, I knew I wanted it to be something that was a little bit chaotic, but still kind of symmetrical. I, I basically just wanted a video that was gonna be like, that would pop off the screen and be very in your face the same way that I felt like the song was and just very kind of like chaotic, but like in a measured way. You know, I think originally we were gonna have the whole first verse be in like a room, but then the walls would fall down and then be in the parking garage. Mm -hmm. We decided the RV thing was better and and the color scheme kind of came from this jacket I had found when I was on tour and when I was first playing the song. So I don't know, it was sort of just like something I storyboarded and kind of kept developing as the date got closer and then we figured it all out and, and shot it. It's probably the only video I've ever made where it actually was the thing I wanted it to be. Oh, like wow. it, I didn't have to compromise anything, you know yeah. what I mean? What was your reaction when you saw, it was the, was a Pepsi commercial on, was it Oscars that mm -hmm. premiered it? Yeah, that must I mean, have been huge. it was pretty amazing, you know, it's just like, what I especially like about the spot is I feel like the spot, the commercial itself, like, fits the song really well. Mm. It doesn't feel like a really forced thing, so that's kind of my favorite part about it. What was your decision to move to L.A. last year? So, it was a little bit more than a year ago that I kind of, in my mind, woke up with this feeling like I just had to, I wanted to just kind of flip the script on everything I was doing, especially cr mainly creatively, you know, I just felt like the what I was pursuing as an artist, that I had achieved that in that stage to the best level of what I was capable of, and I was feeling a little bit, I guess, just like I needed something fresh, like I needed something else to to feel like I was challenging myself, to feel like I was doing something that was a little more scary to me. I was feeling too safe making the kind of music I was making. It just felt like, okay, this is my little world and I'm gonna stay here like a hermit crab and I wanted to to take, a, I guess, a little more of a risk too and be like, well, is this something I can even get away with kind of going back to where it all started, you know? Was it difficult for you, like the transition itself? Yeah, I mean, I'd gone back and forth from Austin and LA so much that I would, you know, LA, I was pretty familiar with LA. I, I think the key was that this time I really came with the intention of building a home instead of being like, oh, I'm just going to like show up and throw my suitcase down and get to work. You know, you have to, I guess I'm learning a little bit more about how to keep mental health mm. in a place like this that's a little bit tough on your 
on your psyche you know it's like a lot of input it's a lot of pressure it's traffic it's a big place and I think you kind of have to learn to give yourself a little space and time to kind of like recoup before you're constantly letting that place take energy from yeah. you. Yeah. How would you say music has changed since the early songs you made? I would say I'm writing songs that make a lot more sense in a good way. Like I think I'm a, I think I'm a, as a lyricist, I'm way less afraid to show myself in the songs. Like I'm not trying to I'm not afraid to like look at the lens of the listener and be like pointing at it and saying what I mean. Whereas before I felt like I was a little bit more like, I'm just kind of singing a song over here and I hope that you hear it. Like it's kind of less direct than being like, here's the song, you know? Not the, it's not so much about the wagging finger as like, I feel like I'm speaking at the listener now mm. rather than just kind of off to myself hoping that it's overheard. Yeah, I see that actually. How would you say you've grown as a person since when you were younger? I feel like I've learned way more patience now. I feel like I've learned to be as mindful of other people as I possibly can at all times, even though so much of my life... I think the part I least like about my career is that it has to focus so much on me, like which makes me uncomfortable. I don't really like feeling like every day of my life is thinking about how I look and how I sound and what I have to say. It just feels kind of selfish. So I guess I try to spend more time thinking about, I guess going back to the writing question, like if I were just a listener of this music, what would I want it to be rather than thinking about myself and what I want, I guess, which is inevitably going to be attached. But um, I feel like I'm, I guess I definitely would say over the past Four or five years I've become much more humbled by life you know mm. what would you say have been your biggest challenges so far I mean the toughest thing about all art is that once you make your best thing it hangs over your head until you make the next best thing yes yeah and that is unfortunately I think the torture of anyone who has success or not, even if, say, your world of people who listen or love what you do, if it's visual art or whatever it is you do, even if it's just ten friends or five friends who look at it, once you make the thing that makes them all go, oh, wow, this is really, really great. This I love this one. We play that again. Then every single thing you do after that means less unless it's as good or better than that thing. Yeah. So it's like you're raising this bar yeah. on yourself that inevitably... Like, the truth is now, I can't, you know, maybe I'll have a good week where I'll make, like, two songs that are strong, but now I'm in a place where it's like, I have to be, I'm trying to reach up and do something that I might even only be capable of doing it once or twice a year. Mm. You know what I mean? Maybe, I hope more, you hope that you figure out something that is, you kind of, maybe you have that moment, maybe I'll never have that moment. You know, I think that's how great albums are made, as artists just, like, get into a weird space. I guess I'm trying to think about it less, mm -hmm. but inevitably the toughest part for me is just knowing that... And also the tough part for me is I, I'm not... I don't like my own stuff that much. Really? Like, I'm not, I don't sit around and listen to my own music like, oh, this is so great. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I can't, I don't Kanye out to my own <laughs> shit, so I have to be like listening to other stuff and bouncing it off people and going like, you like this? I think it's another thing is I've become way better at taking criticism mm. and not taking it emotionally, but just going, okay, do I accept that as valid or is this person just saying something that doesn't, I don't agree with or whatever, you know? Yeah. What does success look like to you? I feel like at some level, I guess as much as I constantly feel like I'm on a hamster wheel that I can't get off of, trying to make it to this piece of cheese that doesn't exist maybe, mm. I also feel like I look back and I'm like, wow, I've, I've been in this business for five years and I've not had to get a job. I mean, to me at some level, I'm like, that's success. You know, yeah. I, I haven't had to go work. I mean, I've been working my ass off, but I haven't been like working a job and that's been for half a decade. So that's 
crazy to me already that it's like, wow. Because I always feel like, oh, I'm not going to make another six months. I have, you know, you feel like the runway is so, so short, but then it just kind of keeps clicking and something happens and then, but I don't know. I mean, I feel like, I don't know. That's, that's a big question. And I ask people that question a lot too. Oh, yeah? I, especially whenever I work with people that have had a whole lot of success, I just ask them, do you feel successful? Mm. And I'm surprised to find that most of them don't. Oh, wow. Always chasing it. Yeah. <laughs> what does love mean to you? I feel like love's too hard to put in words. It's sort of like, what, what does a great song sound like? It's like you just sort mm. of are like, you just kind of know. Yeah. There's no way to be like, oh, that's a great song because of this. And there's other things you might be able to point out, but it just sort of is. Mm -hmm. You're just like, oh, there it is. <laughs> Last question. What do you want to be remembered for? Hmm. I guess I don't care if I'm remembered, but I hope I at least make one song that is remembered. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not remembered. Like Amazing Grace. Yeah. You don't know who wrote that song. <laughs> But everyone knows that song. I hope that I do at least that. Yeah. You know? yeah Which that's like not, that. not at least that, like that's nothing. That's like maybe once in a hundred years we get a song like that. But, but uh, you know, that's maybe what I keep my radio up in the air for mm -hmm. is one of those. Yeah. You know. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for having me. <laughs>